Now, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is American Issues, take two. Title of our episode today is uh, How Do We Reach This Level of National Violence? It's the guns, but it's much more than the guns. And for this show, we have uh, Stephanie Stoll Dalton and Vicky Caetano uh, for the discussion. And we'll talk to them in a moment. Good afternoon, Vicky Caetano and Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Nice to have you on the show, you guys. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Vicky is an esteemed guest, and Stephanie is a regular contributor uh, to this show, American Issues Take Two. So I, I want to start with a question. Let me put it to you, uh, Stephanie. Uh, why is there so much violence in this country? It's an unfair question. I know that. Why? <laughs> Well, I think you already hit a nail on the head with the, the guns, but now going back and thinking about this topic, I'm going back now to the 70s, all right, where we had um, we had the Angela Davis, we had the Symbionese Liberation Army, we had the Black Panthers, and we had all of that busting out in the 70s to the point where you would think America was dangerous to be in for two minutes. So there was a lot of that going on and, and perhaps that even uh, gave more rise to the gun ownership issue that we're dealing with now where people have multiple guns, that those who have guns have many of them and they're not um, uh, actually necessarily following all the rules that go along and all the laws that we have on the books with guns. But there's a lot of guns to have to be able to track or, or monitor. I mean, to the tune of maybe um, more than more than the population numbers that we have in the country. That's over 400 million. Exactly. So uh, anyway, so these are the uh, we have we have that going on. Then the gun ownership and the feeling of being terrified, and that we have these uh, gorillas and we have this danger out there, right? My my concern, my my uh, consternation is at the same time we have Martin Luther King Jr. with his message of nonviolent resistance and 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 uh, marching and and response of citizens to power and we've got these two pieces just in 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 a huge in a huge addressing the the um the issues that we had at the time of the civil rights and other issues uh, similar to that at that time so we've got the the um peace the violent a nonviolent peaceful approach and then we have this absolute warfare going on represented by these other these other groups I've mentioned. So and now here we are. So wonder why we are in such a, a situation because the momentum has just continued with no abatement, no intervention, no anything. So Vicky, you know, uh, we, you know, we used to talk only about guns, but uh, and people with guns doing massacres and too many guns, like Stephanie says. But now we also have uh, evidence that the police with guns or even batons um, are being very brutal and they're killing people who really, you know, shouldn't be killed. Um, and, and then we have people with knives. Um, and so, and, and you know, what, am I missing something? Is there a common denominator among all these various types of violence we see reported? You know, uh, I think that, yes, there is. There, it's more than just, as you say, about the guns. That's a representation of something deeper. I really think that the one of the big challenges is that we're shifting as a society. We're going through a huge transition in terms of who's holding the influence and the power. In our society, as a country, we've never seen as much diversity as we have now corporate world, in politics, all the different faces. And I think that's creating a lot of tension underneath from those who traditionally hold the power. Uh, you look at South Africa when they went through apartheid and the transition, you know, there was a lot of violence there. Uh, in the home front, women now are creating their own place. They're not marrying to in order to have a safe and secure future. They're creating their own financial future. So there's a lot of that tension domestically at, in the home front, I think in the political arena, without a doubt. Um, I think this is uh, really 
one of the big issues that we're not talking about that we need to. Uh, and certainly the media replays it uh, because it is a story. The media today is not just about responsible journalism as we do on think tech. It's a business, what sells, what creates uh, interest. So I think there's just a number of issues that's creating this kind of violence that we're seeing, uh, not only with police brutality, but if you think about that gunman in Monterey Park, you know, a 72 year old man who bursts into two dance studios and kills what appears to be fellow dance uh, colleagues of his. Uh, what's behind that? Now he killed himself, so we don't really know, but we can only piece together from the police reports what may have caused that violence. Mm -hmm. We always have to ask whether mental health is an issue in these cases, particularly when we can no longer talk to the perpetrator, he's dead. Um, you know, but, uh, you, you know, you make a good point about, um, you know, the uh, the press, the media. The media is a player here. So, Stephanie, I want to just identify it's not, it's not uh, only the case in the dance studio. It's the uh, Vermont teenager who was killed in a fight on the basketball court in the last day or so, he was killed uh, on an argument about basketball. My goodness gracious. Uh, in Memphis, of course, the, the, the frenzy, um, which is emblematic of the problem somehow, uh, and it was not racial because everybody on the, on the, on the platform was African-American, uh, and yet it was as brutal as it gets. And uh, the fact that there were cameras there, and those guys could have figured out that the cameras would show them, they nevertheless, beat him to a frazzle and killed him. Um, okay, and then, you know, there's the, um, the, the, the fleeing double amputee in Los Angeles. He's in a wheelchair and he, he has no legs below the knees and he gets out of the wheelchair and runs the other direction. Runs is the, the wrong word. And they shot him 10 times dead. The police did. Did they really need to do that? Did they need to shoot? a double amputee without legs, who is trying to run on the stumps of his legs, who is wheelchair bound. He's running away from, running is the wrong word, running away from them. And they shot him 10 times. And there was an incident in, in the Metro in Washington, DC, uh, very recently about mm -hmm. a shooter who uh, you know shot a number of people and, and killed the, the Metro guard who was there trying to stop him. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a few uh, because, you know, we we used to look at this every week or every two weeks. Now we look at it every day and we saw a whole, a whole potpourri of violences, many of which are lethal vi violences, uh, many of which are, you know, uh, arise out of such anger um, that, you know, you, you, you're not sure what's going on in this country, as, as Vicky says. So my question to you, Stephanie, is the media... As, as uh, Vicky said, you know, the media is playing this up every day. I know what they're going to tell me on television because they've been telling me the same thing all week about Memphis, for example. Um, it's like there's no other news. Uh, is this good for us? Well, oh, that's a wonderful question, Jay, that I've asked myself as it comes on and I start shifting uh channels because I, I don't want to hear about the violence again and again and again. And that did occur to me personally, internally, that very question, is this good to be seeing this over and over again? Um, and, and what is the impact on everyone? And I think that going back again to the history, if we recall back in the uh, LA uh, PD, the police department in uh, Los Angeles, um, I think they were the first to bring the SWAT team on and to to address these conflagrations that they were having in that that zone, um, and certainly not the only place there were issues. But um, they were questioning whether the police should be brought in with all of that armor. Is that and that that question persists? Is who is supposed to have all of this armor and equipment? Um, that goes on today. We still haven't really responded to well, that. We saw that in the, in the Scorpion group in yeah. Memphis. Exactly. What do we need that or armor for? Well, of course, as time has gone on, we've got all of this, uh, uh, you know, weaponry out there. So certainly um, the police need to be equal combatants. And I think that that's driven uh, 
ahead with a lot of this to be even combatants. But um, one of the other things that might be in play here is that um, aren't these men, uh, all of these men and women who are policemen, I think in most places they're taught to shoot to kill. When If you're going to shoot, you shoot to kill because you can't say, oh, I'm going to hit him on the right ear or the left pinky or, you know, the heel that because you can't, you can't react towards that tiny, a target, whatever the rationale is. And they've evidently decided that most police people are actually taught when they do shoot, shoot to kill. But our question I think is, or my question, why are they shooting? What, what's bringing that gun out? Um, is it mortal threat in the case in these cases you're miss you're mentioning, Jay? There's not mortal threat to the police. So, mm -hmm. and 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 then okay. So I'm just jumping around here, but I did want to just say the po the British people don't the British police people do not have guns. They they have like the baton. So anyway, I'm just these questions you're asking are really. Hey, but let me let me go back to the the first question I asked you, and that is. Um, you know, uh, is the press overdoing this? And what effect does it have if the press is just laden with scenes of violence and funerals and people mm -hmm. calling for justice and all that? What effect does that have on 330 million Americans? Agreed, D Jay. That that is really important, and maybe they need feedback from the public uh, on on how they're consuming all of this repetitive uh, information. Every single show takes it on. Mm -hmm. So um, there could be some program um, designing that, that might lead us away from- well, I think, the, you know, the common point is, of course, they want raw meat that sells and it sells ads. Um, but the other thing is they're, they're conveying a message that the United States is, is flawed. And uh, that we have serious social problems here. Mm -hmm. And I think that affects people in some way. I mean, it's a it's a whole social psychology issue, but it also travels around the world. And to the extent that it may be glorifying violence or exaggerating violence, um, everyone in the world sees the United States as a as a violent place, mm -hmm. which you know to some extent is true in the sense that um, it was more violent now than it was say ten years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but in another sense, it's it's unfair to us that we should have a global image of um, being violent. Vicky, I wanted to ask you. About, <laughs> Ed, you have yeah, comment. do you really think it's an unfair image, uh, Jay Fidel? I think to an extent we've earned that, you know. Now, to be fair, media is going to say we have a responsibility, that's what they're going to say, to report these critical news and to try to impact society for the better. But while there may be some truth to that, the other side of it, frankly, is media today is a business, okay? There are not many think techs that do this really to just simply talk about issues. It is a business. And so they are going to put out, as you say, the raw meat that sells. And that's why they keep putting this on. And you have to ask, does this in turn make it, do we as a society now hearing so much of this, are we becoming numb? numb to all of the killings, the gun violence. We're just like, oh, another shooting. How many this time? You know, we just become numb to it. And that I think is very dangerous. Well, you know, the other thought is um, it's on television and it's not my city, not my city. It's some other city, right. maybe miles away, half a, half a world away, half a continent away. Uh, not going to affect me. But then, you know, if you see it over and over again, you say, well, maybe... It is coming to my city. Maybe I have to have a, a more personal kind of fear. Maybe I have to take steps to protect myself. You know, gun sales are up dramatically in this country. Thank you, Congress. Thank you very much. Um, and so, you know, people are buying guns. Who knows whether they're buying guns to be aggressive or defensive, but they're buying more guns. More guns equals more gun violence. So I guess the, you know, the question is... Um, are people internalizing this as per personal feel fear? Are they are they now at a point where they see it happening to them or someone they know in their city? Yeah, I, I definitely think there are people who are genuinely fearful 
and they are getting guns to protect themselves. The sad part is violence begets violence, you know, and as we have seen now, I'm sure we're at a record number of gun ownership in our country, more than any country in the world. And yet we are, uh, from a developed country perspective, the most violent country as well. So it's not working. Mm -hmm. Well, you say it's not working, but what is working? I mean, I mean what, what is it that we have? Our gun control laws are really dishwater, uh, mm -hmm. including that uh, statute that Congress passed after uh, the Uvalde incident last, last mm -hmm. summer. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, uh, I wanted to ask you a, one of my favorite questions, okay? How much <laughs> has this got to do with your friend, Donald J. Trump? I say your friend because I know he's not my friend. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> how much has this got to do? Did, did he do things that somehow unleashed the violence that we are seeing now? Well, frankly, um, in my opinion, uh, I believe so because of the base that he invokes and provokes and uh, tolerates. So the people that are his biggest supporters, strongest supporters are people that he wouldn't have in Mar-a-Lago and people that would not, he would not welcome to the dinner table there. And he wouldn't feel safe if they were there. But those are the people that he can in, in provoke to his messages, which are, I'm not going to get in the way of any of this. I'm going to support you. And I love the way you are, as he says often, and I'm going to give you opportunities to be the way you are. But of course, I'm not that doing that myself. So we, we really do have some had, we have had someone in the leadership, the major leadership position that has uh, um, accommodated them, absolutely accommodated them. And even from Charlottesville with the both kinds of people are really fine people. And now uh, also the very fine people that attack the United States Capitol. So here is our, in our apocalyptic movies, mostly starring Charlton Heston and these people, we see them walking along the beach, you know, and there's nothing left on the earth except the, the Statue of Liberty is usually fallen over and is lying there on the beach. Well, I think when we do them going forward, we need to have a big gun line there because that, that is becoming as you were saying in your late last, last comments that america is overwhelmingly gun gun is becoming our symbol and i just wish we could do something about that yeah you know vicky think of the um, proud boys and the oath keepers uh, you know they turn up at right-wing events there was an article in the paper about that they turn up and they wear guns. Um, I mean, open carry is really important to them. They they walk into a state legislature with guns. Mm -hmm. Nobody stops them. Uh, mm -hmm. Those organizations and many others like them are all about guns and macho and phallic symbols. Um, and you know that is their religion. It's all built around the extension of their personal power through guns. Um, and then uh, I want to ask one more part of that question, television. Uh, and I'm not talking about news now. I'm talking about entertainment. I'm talking about Netflix, Prime, and half a dozen others, which show you what they believe and what is probably truly popular um, in the way of these movies. And the movies, like, I don't want to say 90%, but maybe 80% um, are all about guns and violence, and vengeance, and hatred. I mean, we, we live, we're in a swamp. I hate to use that term, it's a Trump swamp, a Trump term. Uh, we're, we're, in a, we're, we're drowning, okay, in entertainment that is all really about violence, and it's telling us that violence is okay. It's telling us if you wanna act out, hey, go for it, be violent. Um, so, I mean, how, do you agree with me about the connection? Absolutely, Jay. And first, I will say of Donald Trump, as president of the United States, not a major leadership, but the main leader, the leader of this country, he legitimized violence. He encouraged it. There's no question what happened at the Capitol. So that definitely played a role. 
And then I do think as a country, we are paying a price for uh, invoking that freedom and individual rights must always come first. We've created a culture now where that's sometimes translated to yeah, individual right, like I wanna uh, take it out on you because I'm angry at you and at the rest of the world. Uh, the violence you see is uh, disguised as entertainment that our young people and our children are, have grown up watching. To me, that definitely has made an impact to the problem that we're seeing and dealing with gun violence. Mm -hmm. Say gun violence, Vicky, but you know we have other kinds of violence. We have um, we have baseball bats, uh, we have batons, uh, we have all kinds of weapons that are not gun knives, big knives, uh, which are used in lethal attacks. And I wonder if you see a connection between the um, you know the the fact that guns are out of control. I think any reasonable person would agree. Guns are out of control in this country. But do you see a connection between that and, and um, you know, violence and death and injury and personal attacks using other weapons? I, I do. And I know that uh, people in that industry will always disagree. They say, oh, that's not real. But to a young person, to a child in particular, what's real and what's not real? So what they're seeing is, I think it, it does create, it an, a, create an aura around this violence as part of entertainment, video games that are very violent that yeah. they play today. You know, it, it, parents today have a really tough time now. It's mm -hmm. not what goes on outside your house. It what go, it's what your child sees inside your home. <laughs> You know, and I do think that has an impact. It's a price we paid as a society in the name of freedom and the individual rights that we want. And we're paying a big price for it now. There's definitely thinking of that. You're thinking of that child in, in elementary school who shot his teacher. Mm -hmm. he, he brought a gun to class. And for reasons that are not exactly clear, he shot his teacher. At, at the age, I mean, he was less than 10 six years, years old. Six years old. Six. Six years old. Can you believe that? You know, so, yeah, these are all tied in. I don't think you can say just one thing has created what we're seeing today. There are a number of things. And that's what makes the problem so challenging. But there, it has to start at the top. And for me, having a president like Donald Trump absolutely did not help and definitely made things even worse. We're seeing it now. So, um, you know, Stephanie, it's, it's very interesting that we, we have a divided country. The country is divided on questions of law and rule of law, on constitutional protections or not. Um, a, a million different public policy issues have divided the country. We are divided. And, and people are you know, really excited about, angry about the dividedness. Um, and my question to you is, does that play into this? If I get so angry, so excited about my political position on a given issue, does that sort of feed into the next step, the step of violence on the street, violence with guns, violence with weapons, violence against racial groups? Well, the interesting question, I, I think that um, it does, uh, except that we've had COVID, we've had economic d distress. So people have had the priorities, the, the living and eating and getting by uh, to deal with. I await um, the young people who have come out of these high schools where they have lost uh, friends and, and classmates. Okay, so from Columbine on, I was hoping that in indeed, as these young people said while they were still high schoolers, that they were going to do something about this. And I think the one that has only risen to prominence is uh, Mr. Hogg, um, whatever his first name is, David, but da Mr. Hogg, and I've seen him speak, and he's very, very powerful. 
But where is it that they're working? Where is their funding? Why aren't these young people who have been there, done it and reject it and want to uh, remediate the nation from doing that? So where is their work? And why isn't that on every time they show something on TV? I would say couple up these uh, violent presentations if we have to have that meat out there, then couple that up with how things are going in the way of ameliorating this. How are we mitigating this in the US? What are the efforts and who are the people? And let's start showing these people that are working hard on it. And then of course there's the Congress. And it's just like with that taking, um, Ilhan off of the Foreign Relations Committee, 211 of them voted her off. Really? All 211 thought that was the thing to do? Do we have to be in lobster? So this gets us into the whole political thing, Jay. You know, why are why is that all lockstep? Why is that Congress all locked down? under the leadership. I don't think that's what Jefferson and Madison and Adams all, um, had in mind, is it? That we can't get anything moving? Respond? Well, it's clear, is it? as we've said, it's, it's clear that this is no longer a monthly or a weekly event. It's a daily event, sometimes more than a day, sometimes in various cities uh, throughout the day. And you would think that Congress would get the message. You would think that every Republican would get the message, but they doubled down on it. And, and they're out there protecting their view of the Second Amendment. Uh, I find that extraordinary. And I, and I wonder, you know, you, you talk about lockstep, it evokes the thought that they're completely irrational and they're not in there to, you know, yeah. to perform their oath mm -hmm. to protect the country. They're in there on some kind of um, I, ideologue mission to protect the guns yeah uh, extraordinary they don't do anything and and last uh, last summer they didn't do anything after you know a horrendous attack in texas and all these other attacks and all these other expressions of violence they don't do anything zero crickets with the babies even and so i i know that uh they've had their share of challenges but why aren't the kennedys doing something about this they lost two of their men to uh, assassination. Why are these people not? Anyway, they're not. So they're not. And the Martin Luther King family, too. They lost a very young man who had great potential, uh, very accomplishing, and still could have done 40 more years of that. And they lost him. Now they've got the nonviolent approach. But how can we turn the attention of the huge influencers um, of change, uh, maybe, towards this really important issue, because internationally, we're going to be a pariah. Who wants to come here for a vacation? You want to go to Chicago, for God's sake? Yeah, then you hear about tourists going to LA. By the way, I want to add one thing, is that uh, we have Erin Davis, and she's with the the Brady Group. Uh, oh, good. Brady they're the ones shot. that have done a lot. Yeah, they've Brady. done a lot, and uh, they're mostly in court. You know, they do lobbying, too, but they're in in court, suing gun manufacturers and yes, yes, that have been negligent about guns. Really important. So why don't we hear more about that? And why is that the only one? I mean, I mean, what what are the other ones, Jay? I don't know. I can't name them. See, we but don't. We should have all this. We should know what's going on. Yes, because we should, and that's why we're here. A major problem. I and mean, what does take a shot in our own heads to get active? Well, and maybe in uh, our own community, it's coming. Right now, we have. We have people from the mainland who come here and, and support open carry. And uh, they're changing a, a, a society. They're trying to change a, a society here in Hawaii that really didn't have a lot of guns um, to be a society that has more guns. That's very yeah. interesting that mainland influences. Vicki, you have a thought? You know, we have not talked to about follow the money. I mean, the gun manufacturers play a very big role in this. They're lobbying. Uh, it has tremendous influence. When you talk about Congress, well, what do you think is influencing Congress? These gun manufacturers, because follow the money. And that, at the end of the day, is part of the big issue. Well, and the, the other part is the ghost guns. Don't forget the ghost guns, because you can do a ghost gun on a 3D printer. has no serial number, and uh, what, I forget what city it was. I think it might have been New York. Uh, hundreds of ghost guns have been uh, have been found and um, you know appropriated. Um, no, so but if Jake, if it's going to that's going to increase. 
but the if we can now Sandy Hook people, they got distracted by the idiot who was denying that it ever happened. So they had to go down that route for 12 years. So, but thereafter, Remington or whoever's the gun manufacturer for um the AR, uh, if that's the gun they used at Sandy Hook, I, I'm not completely sure of my details here. Really, but do you really think that's gonna stop guns in this no. country? Yes, I, I agree with Vicki. I think that's an, a critical component is uh, get at the, they are making more money hand over fist. But you think they, suing them is going to stop? It's it has not. to keep going, but they ha we have to keep going with it until the awards are so huge, which is what Sandy Hook is getting uh, the movement towards. They're, they're getting them way, way up there, even um, uh, yeah, anyway. Let me, so. let me go to you, Vicki. We're, we're in that part of the discussion where we are seeking solutions here. You know, one of them is what the radio organization does, uh, you know, suing the gun manufacturers or anyone in the, you know, the supply line um, yeah. who has enabled this. Yeah. Um, but there are other things too. And there was an article in the Times a, a couple of days ago about how uh, the Biden administration has essentially thrown money into anti-violence around the country, but um, that a lot of the programs uh, that he's given it to are ineffectual uh, or corrupt, and it's not working. So throwing money from the other side, from the governmental side, is not necessarily a solution. Your thoughts, Vicki? You know, you're absolutely right. Again, follow the money. A lot of these uh, fundings that go to so-called for the good cause uh, actually end up in the wrong, being used the wrong way. Uh, I think that everybody should not just be waiting for someone else to do it. You know, wouldn't it be great if instead of reacting to somebody who has been killed by police, that we could proactively, as you say, look for opportunities to glorify the positive behavior. We often glorify the negative behavior with so much attention, you know, even if we're not praising it, but just the fact that they get attention mm -hmm. creates copycats, creates people who who seek that kind of attention. So I think we need to bring more balance to this. And there is no one single solution, but certainly leadership at the government level and in the private sector, and don't forget in our homes. Mm -hmm. And I know it's hard for parents, but really spending more time with your kids, talking to them, uh, even though it may be difficult, but talk about these tough issues, talk to them about it. And I think it's going to take us all coming together in order to have some kind of impact on this gun violence issue, violence in general. You know, there are lobbyists coming into the state, um, you know, supporting, advocating for, um, you know, uh, uh, open carry and other expansions of, 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 you know, the gun limitations here, which is really tragic because we don't have a problem. Uh, and we haven't had a problem. And they come in here and do that. They're also uh, trying to uh, undermine our abortion laws. Um, and, I, you know, there's a part of me wants to say, why don't you guys go home? We don't need you here. Uh, you're, you're expressing some sort of national ideology that we don't want. We don't care about it. Why do you come in here and mess with, with our idyllic society? Um, that's what I want to say. What do you want to say to them? Ah, but Jay, they will say it's their right, freedom, and this is the big price we pay, you see. Mm -hmm. You know that if you even tried to do that, it would be challenged in court and you would lose. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the big prices that we're paying for, whether it's freedom to see anything we want to see at any time of the day, uh, the impact it has to our children, uh, freedom to carry a gun, uh, it's all of these things coming together. And uh, unfortunately, as a uh, society, we're paying a huge price for all of it. We, we've got to be willing to let go of some of this in order for us to reclaim what's ours, what is our right, I believe, which is to live in a safe community. Now, we have to speak to our legislators about it and tell them to resist these carpet baggers who come around here <laughs> and, <laughs> and try to pull the rug out from under us. Stephanie, your thoughts? I want to make one point uh, that I think is as good as Vicky's point about follow, following the money, and it is that these are all young men. Could we stand up and address that? It is all young men. 
So we got two factors there that they've tried to work on the young part to raise the sales of guns to older, to, to higher ages, but it's boys. So Vicky's point about the home and how they're uh, tending to these issues in the homes with the young boys. So when is that okay in a democracy to, to notice that it is all boys? <laughs> so could we please pay attention <laughs> to some intervention here? I mean, geez, I, I, I just, I mean, it's like we're the, the elephant is just so big. There's not even any room to breathe and talk around it. So anyway, I, I do think we need to consider that. And I, I hope that that's not a challenge to get, you know, girls involved in this. But the fact of the matter is we we do have a particular situation here that is identifiable easily. Yeah. Vicki is going to point out to you, the guy in the dance hall was 72 years old. He okay. Was, he was uh, a boy, right. but he was not young. Yeah. Uh, so we have an unyoung one, but that he was male. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, something's going on here with that. And there's, and that also might be a part of the advertising, the follow the money, Vicky's point, and the, the way uh, all of this information is uh, characterized on the television to make it appealing to young men, right? So somehow they're the ones being influenced and who are sucking up this message to do something like I, this. I want to make a, a, a one statement, then I'll turn it over to you guys for your final comments and my statement is this. Um, I, I believe that uh, Trump and, you know, the process of the country over the past 10 years anyway, has broken the, uh, the, the, the ties that bind us. In other words, um, people don't like the federal government. They don't like the United States. They don't like the rule of law. Uh, a lot of them, the base and more. Um, they don't respect it. And they don't feel mm, part of it. Uh, and in fact, we are a part of the government and the government is part of us. And, you know, I, I rue the day when they knocked off the draft in the 70s, because that, that meant that a, a young person, man or woman, would understand the relationship of the citizen and the government. It's more than just paying your taxes and registering your car. It's more than that. Mm -hmm. You have to connect with the government, respect mm -hmm be part of the government and see the government as working for you. And I think when we break those ties that bind, we are, we are allowing for chaos. And part of the chaos is this, it's the violence. And the violence will only continue and exacerbate unless we find a meaningful solution. Okay, that's my, my last comments. What about your last comments? Vicki, you first. That was so beautiful, that was so well stated, Jay. I would just say amen to all of that. I have nothing else. That was just the way you said it, right on. That's it? Yep. It's such <laughs> a, right. you summarized it so perfectly. I would, I have nothing else to add. It's beautiful. Well, thank you for that. Stephanie? Right. Well, I want to build on your statement and, and say now that those draftees or however we want to phrase that uh, going forward, I would really love to see uh, some kind of program that would pull in our youth and that it would be boys and girls all go for whether it's a draft or some other kind of program that gets everybody out of their community and into the world to see some things that are they're going to find are much like us, but an awful lot different in some very interesting ways and that they can come back and understand this country in a, in a much deeper way than they can now. Yeah. The violence is emblematic, as you both said, of larger, more profound problems under the hood. We'll cover it again. Stephanie Stoll Dalton, Vicki Caetano, thank you so much for this important discussion. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.